Hello, everyone. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. Actually, it's 8.02. Sorry about that. I am a tad late today, but thank you for joining me. It is, of course, 8 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, which can only mean one thing. It means my wife took my two kids to a uh, carnival while I'm here in air conditioning talking to you all. It says I'm in New Jersey and it is uh, 95 degrees and super humid. So she's outside walking around uh, some, you know, mosquito infested grass yard with with some uh, cheap, dangerous rides and then with my kids. And, and here I am. So anyway, uh, thank you for having me. And yes, this is one of my favorite T-shirts, but I believe it's backwards. Actually, uh, I got this from the local running store in town called Runner's High. And uh, I realized a while ago that I think they printed this on backwards. I think these seams are typically on the shoulder, you know, the uh, back end of the shirt. But nonetheless, it's one of my favorite shirts. Fits well, comfortable. So uh, I'm going with it. Um, okay. Comments are working. David Fault. Oh, man. Exclamation point this week, David Fault. Super enthused. Not just a period. Uh, thank you. One thing. I don't know what that means, but okay, cool. All um, oh, right. Yeah, cool. I mean, one thing. Just one thing only. Um, so tonight's topic, the widow and widower tax penalty. Now, as you'll see throughout the course of tonight, it's not necessarily a penalty. It depends on how you choose to view it. It's simply the tax code. It is what it is. And it is the phenomena of when a married couple, uh, when one spouse passes, the surviving spouse's uh, tax rate and, and amount of tax perhaps uh, often go up, even though income may go down. And I'll show you an example of, of uh, why that is and, and what causes it. Um, tonight's topic should be relatively short. It's a, you know, a succinct, punchy kind of kind of thing here. So um, I'll try not to ramble on too much and I'll take questions at the end. Before we get going, uh, dad jokes as always. First is I've started telling people about the benefits of dried grapes. It's all about raisin awareness. You know what I'm saying? Which one of King Arthur's knights built the round table? Circumference, of course, circumference. And finally, my wife says, I only have two faults. I don't listen and something else. Oh, man, that's so true. It's so painfully true. Um, okay, disclosure. Hold on, let me find it. Where'd it go? Here it is. This video is only general explanations and education. It is not specific tax, legal, or investment advice. Before considering acting on anything you see in this video, first consult with your tax, legal or investment advisor, which I am not. I am some uh, chap here on Facebook live talking about tonight's case, the widow and widower tax penalty. All right. Without further ado, let me get into it. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I will take questions as always. Just wait till the end. Let me kind of run through my bit here and then I'm happy to, to answer whatever you all have. So let me pull up my slides. Where are we at here? Here we go. All righty. I don't know if you can see my screen here. It says only 84 degrees right now. I don't know that I believe that. It feels like it's comfortably in the 90s. Not comfortably, but well into the 90s. Definitely was today. It was uh, 98 according to my dashboard temperature reading today and, and humid, like I said. Um, all right. So the, the core thing behind what the widow, widow tax penalty is, is simply there's different tax treatment, tax rates, tax brackets for um, single folks versus folks who are married and file a joint return. There's a few other classifications of tax filing. There's head of household, there's qualifying widow or widower. In both cases, it requires you to have, you're, you're single uh, or were previously married and you have some sort of dependent, whether it's a child or other relative, you have a dependent. Most people, most cases, those things aren't going to qualify. So you're either going to file as a single uh, tax filer or a married tax filer. Specifically for married, I'm talking about uh, married filing joint. There is a married filing separate option. Rarely makes sense for people. Whole separate topic of when you maybe want to consider that. But vast, vast majority of folks who are married, it's in your interest to file a joint tax return. So that's what I'm talking about tonight. So it starts with... Um, not to get into too much about how tax returns work, but you basically have all of your gross income. You deduct from that your deductions, and the IRS allows two different types of deductions, either a standard deduction, which everyone gets, no questions ask, asked, or itemized deductions where they let you add up certain things, and if the sum of those things exceeds the amount of your standard deduction, then you want to deduct that, your itemized deductions. 
So you take your gross income, you subtract out your deductions, you have your taxable income. That's the figure against which or, or through which, that's the figure you run through your, your, your tax brackets, the different tax rates. So right off the bat, all else equal, married folks have a, a larger standard deduction than single folks. This is for 2021. If you are married and file a joint return, you can shave right off the top $25,100 of standard deduction. You, know, you, you slice that off your gross income. Plus, if you're 65 or older, uh, each spouse, and, and that's 65 by December 31st of this year, um, you can take off another $1,350 per person that's 65 or older, or also uh, disabled or blind qualifies as well for this additional um, thing on top of being over 65. So if you're 65 and you're blind, for example, you can take off uh, 2,700 bucks from your return. Plus your spouse can also take off another 1350, you know, if he or she's 65 or whatever. Uh, versus if you're single, the, the standard deduction is half the amount. It's $12,550 for single filers, but slightly higher um, uh, additional deduction. If you're 65 or older, it's $1,700 as opposed to 1350 if you're married. So, so why is this now? Is it a penalty that single filers have a smaller standard deduction than married filers? Or would it be a penalty if married filers didn't have double the deduction of single filers, right? So if the married, it, it depends what perspective you're looking at this. That's why I'm saying, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm splashy making clickbait stuff here to call this the widow, widower tax penalty. That's how I've heard it referred to many times. That's how, how I learned it. But like I said, it's not necessarily a penalty. It's just the tax code at work. Whether or not it is a penalty kind of depends on which perspective you're viewing it from, right? Um, think about it this way. All else equal, a single person's making $100,000 from, you know, from earnings. If that person gets married to a spouse who's also making $100,000, it'd kind of be unfair if their tax brackets and their, you know, their, their tax treatment wasn't double because all else equal, it's now two people. Um, so why wouldn't they get sort of larger, uh, you know, tax brackets or deductions. So anyway, I'm off on a tangent already, but point is it's not necessarily a penalty. This whole thing could be depending what perspective you're looking from. Uh, but this is part of it because single people have lower standard deductions. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. If you're married, <laughs> oh man, sorry. I got to... David Fultz, 98 degrees. I remember that group. Yeah. Nick Lachey. What's he doing now? And his brother, um, these were one of, this is probably the third most popular boy band at the time in the late nineties, followed by, uh, what, what was, uh, NSYNC or Backstreet Boys. Depends who you ask, who was the biggest. I'd probably say Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, then 98 degrees. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Great comment. Uh, David Fultz. Thank you. So getting back to this, um, if you are married, uh, you know, and you have a certain amount of income, your standard deduction is going to be, let's say, you know, 25 plus thousand dollars. One spouse dies, the surviving spouse eventually has to start filing a single, specifically starting the year after uh, the year of the spouse's death. All of a sudden now, standard deduction gets cut in half. So that's part of why uh, there's this, this widow, widower tax penalty. Next, oh, I just throw some numbers around this. Um, yeah, if, if, if both people in the couple are over 65, the standard deduction is $27,800 for 2021. If a single person is 65 or older, the standard deduction is 14250 So right off the bat, the married couple has $13,550 less of taxable income, all else equal, because the married couple has uh, larger standard deductions. And then the tax brackets themselves are larger for married folks than they are single folks. I won't get too into the, the weeds here, but for 2021, these are tax brackets. So the first uh, up to... Um, yeah, if you're single, the first $9,950 of income is all taxed at 10%. Anything over that is taxed at, uh, uh, 12%. And then, you know, you have these brackets here. So for all these brackets up until the last one, the 37% for all these brackets, the, uh, married filing joint brackets are, are literally double what they are for single. Again, sort of makes sense, right? If you assume you have two incomes, two jobs, two pensions, two whatever, um, it would kind of be unfair for married folks if there wasn't larger tax brackets than for single folks. So the IRS just makes them double. Where it's not double is this last bracket, as you can see here. You know, for married folks, once your your income taxable income is over five hundred twenty-three thousand bucks, you're getting taxed at thirty-seven percent on all those dollars. 
But as for married folks, that's not double. It doesn't start at a million plus. It starts at 628,300 is where a 37% tax bracket starts. So anyway, so this is part of it as well. Uh, again, when one spouse dies, a single, the, the surviving spouse eventually starts filing a single and his or her tax brackets get condensed. The rates are the same. It's still 10%, 12%, 22, 24, et cetera. But the bra income brackets at which those rates start stepping up get halved uh, for most of them. Um, you know, the 37% is not, not half, but. So that's part of the other issue. Okay. Um, what do I have next? Right. Here we go. I got a little surprise for you. Who's this? Anyone know who this is? I'll give you 15 seconds because I want to see some answers. Dave Fultz, I'm looking at you right here. Um, you'll find out in a second why I have a picture of this dapper fellow and his bike and his gloves and his motorcycle. Um, this is... For those of you who don't know, quick drum roll, David Fultz, I'm looking at you. Where's your comment? Oh, what? Mary Sherwin, John Mayer? What? Oh, what? Oh, oh. Close. John Cougar uh, also at some point became John Cougar Mellencamp. Um, why am I bringing him up? Little Pink Houses, Dave Meyer says. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. One of his best known works, Little Pink Houses. I'm talking more about, I want to tell you a little ditty about Jack and Diane. Two American kids growing up in the heartland. Um, well, actually, I guess not growing up anymore. Jack, Jack and Diana are in their 70s in my example. So they grew up in the heartland, let's say. So let me let me give you an example of a you know, hypothetical couple and show you how the uh, or what the marriage, the, the widow, whatever tax penalty is. Thanks to John Cougar Mellencamp for a little ditty about Jack and Diane. That's my hypothetical couple here. All right. So let's let's assume this. Jack and Diane are married. Um they're in their 70s. Start here's their income for the year. Jack has social security getting 30 grand a year. Diane also has social security getting 18 grand a year. Uh, Jack also has a pension getting 30 grand a year. And they're both of required minimum distribution age. Jack, let's assume he has a six hundred thousand dollar IRA. He's age 75. His RMD, he needs to take out at least twenty six thousand four hundred dollars this year. Diane similarly has an IRA, $100,000 in it. She's 72. Her RMD, and, and I'm rounding here, but her RMD is 3,900 bucks, which means their total income, you know, total dollars in is $108,300. For 2021, inclusive of their standard deduction, their total federal tax, this is just federal, total federal tax bill is $8,345, which is 7.7% .7 of their hundred and eight plus thousand dollars of total income for the year. Okay. This is married. Now, what happens if, Di uh, if Jack were to die? Now it's just Diane. Look what happens now. And this is a hypothetical that there's infinite combinations of what ifs and incomes and whatever, but I just tried to pick a general scenario. Uh, and unfortunately this, this tax penalty, if you will, is, uh, uh, often more of an impact for women because women historically live longer. So um, sadly, this is something that that women are more likely to face uh, than men in life. Not always the case, obviously, but um, anyway. So I, I tried to kind of come up with a with a scenario here that's um, you know relatively common or average, if you will. But everyone's circumstance is going to be different. So anyway, so so Jack Jack passes unfortunately. So now it's a little ditty just about Diane. Um, Here's what happened to the income. So Jack died. His social security went away, but it effectively lives on now for Diane by way of survivor benefits. In a married couple, when there's uh, each spouse has social security, when one spouse dies, the surviving spouse gets the higher of the two spouses payments. That's the payment that lives on. The lower payment goes away. Um, that's the cleanest way to think about it. So Jack's social security stopped, but his 30,000 took over Diane's, what was 18,000 of social security. Now Diane's getting $30,000 a year of social security. Jack's pension continues on the same to Diane. Let's say he chose a hundred percent, what's called joint and survivor benefit. So that when he dies, if he, if he were to predecease Diane, his pension lives on a hundred percent of it lives on for Diane. So Diane's still getting a $30,000 pension. Jack no longer has an RMD. Jack's gone. Uh, Diane, which is typically the way to do it, the, the surviving spouse takes over the deceased spouse's IRA and makes it their own, you know, rolls it into their own. 
So now Jack, because he doesn't have an IRA anymore, because Jack has, uh, you know, left this world, um, his six hundred thousand dollar IRA was rolled into Diane's. So add that to the hundred thousand Diane already had. Diane now has uh, where am I? Seven hundred thousand dollars of IRA. She's still age seventy two. Now again, I'm I'm making some really dumbed down assumptions here. You know, I'm assuming time hasn't passed. So Diane is still 72. I'm assuming the IRA values haven't changed. I'm just trying to paint a picture here. Um, stick with me, folks. So anyway, um, Diane's RMD now on her $700,000 IRA is going to be a little over 27,000 uh, bucks. She's still age 72, like I said. So now Diane's total income dropped some. It went from $108,300 $108, when Jack was alive to now $87,300. Logically went down some, but, but not precipitously, thankfully. However, total income went down, but look at her taxes now. Her taxes, federal taxes now, because she's single, smaller tax brackets, smaller standard deduction, her total federal tax is $10,841 on $87,300 of income. So that means that total tax is 12.4% of her total income. This is the widow widower tax penalty. Diane, as a survivor, has $21,000 less of income than she did when Jack was alive, but is paying nearly $2,500 more in federal taxes. Mic drop, done, Andy out. Widow, widow or tax penalty. That's it right here. There's more to it. I'm, I'm going to get to that. But as far as just like basic uh, income, federal income tax return calculations, this is a relatively common scenario. Not these exact numbers, obviously, but, you know, the gist of surviving spouse's income goes down some taxes could quite possibly go up, um, which which is, you know, insult to injury when you're dealing with the emotional grief and distress and, and, and heartbreak of having lost a spouse. Well, guess what? Now you got to pay more taxes. Uh, in, in many cases. Um, so that, 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 that's my example. Um, not great. And, and, you know, in addition from, from just the tax aspect of it, expenses may not go down that much either. Um, you know, s some things stop, obviously, like the deceased spouse no longer has Medicare to pay for, no longer has, you know, there's, there's less food, less clothes, uh, clothes going to be used and consumed within the household. Maybe you have one less car, um, you know, uh, what else? I don't know. Auto insurance is going to drop a little bit, but a lot of life's major expenses aren't going to change. If you live in a house, whether you have a mortgage or rent or utilities or whatever, they're not going to change. The house is still there. You know, your utilities might drop slightly because you have less people, you know, leaving lights on or whatever. Um, like I said, your food bill goes down. Probably you're doing a little less, uh, you know, discretionary fun travel spending, at least in the early years. Maybe, you know, you pick up and actually do more down the road after the, you know, you're, you're somewhat past the grief stage or there's less grief, at least. I mean, the grief stage never, never stops. But, um, you know, when you're willing and able and ready to, to get back out there and, and live life and enjoy. So th this could be like a, a double a double doozy, right? Not only does income go down. Your expenses may not go down as much as your income did. So that right there could be not cool. And then couple with that, your taxes almost uh, are quite likely are going to go up. So that's the whammy of the widow, widower tax penalty. Um, other things to keep in mind. So the example I just went through, this is just, just straight up, you know, federal income tax calculations and in this hypothetical income scenario for, for Jack and Diane, well, now just Diane. Um, this also usually should apply at the state level unless you live in a state like you know florida or texas with no income tax um most states that have income tax do have some sort of you know single structures different than marriage structure so the same phenomenon is going to present itself to some extent uh in, in many state income tax scenarios as well and not just federal which is which is what i'm showing here okay uh teresa wood i know i said i wouldn't take questions till the end but j just so you know so so she's asking one of getting slightly ahead of things, but yeah. Um, actually hold that thought, Teresa. I'll come back to you. So here's, in addition to just the, the, you know, the straight up income tax calculation, here's some other possible uh, things that can come into play all in the vein of this widow, widower tax penalty. First, Medicare Irma. Um, you know, we discussed this a lot in the group. If you're married and file a joint return, you once you have total gross income, it's technically modified adjusted, but let's just call it total gross income to keep it simple. Once it's over $176,000, uh, each person who's on Medicare or, or each person who's 63 actually or older 
their Medicare premiums two years later will be somewhat elevated, depending how much you are over that $176,000 figure, your premium surcharge can go up. Well, guess what? When you're single, those surcharges get cut in half, right? Uh, married folks, it's 176 grand where their Medicare surcharges start. For single folks, it's 88 grand of total income is where Medicare surcharges start. So not only may your, uh, you know, your, your, your normal income tax be higher, but guess what? You may now trigger yourself into uh, having some Medicare premium surcharges that you didn't or wouldn't have had if you were still single. Uh, if, I'm sorry, if you're still married, your spouse is still alive because you're, you now have a uh, you know, condensed uh, IRMA threshold. Social Security, the amount of Social Security that's subject to federal income tax is also based on the rest of your sources of income. The actual formula for this is kind of convoluted and beyond the scope of tonight, but just know that all else equal, uh, the more income you have, the, the more of your social security will get pulled into taxation. And the income levels at which more social security gets pulled in are lower for single folks than they are married folks. It's not half, but it's nonetheless lower. So for single folks, there's something called quote unquote combined income is the measure of income social security uses to determine how much your income is taxable. Uh, taxation starts at 25 grand for single folks and 32 grand of, of combined income for married folks. So um, Teresa, for your question, in my specific example for what it's worth, um, when they combined had $48,000 of gross social security benefits, only like 83 point something percent of it was taxable. After Jack passed, and Diane uh, was a surviving spouse, even though Diane's social security dropped from 48 grand as a married couple to 30 grand as a single person, the taxability of it went up. Now the full 85% of her social security is taxable. Whereas when, they were, when Jack was still alive, only 83 point something percent of it was taxable. So uh, there, there is some of that going on here as well. Social security taxation is, is getting messed up a little bit because of the widow widow tax penalty. Um, good question, observation. Uh, another one, the net, invest, net investment income tax. One of the um, lesser known kind of hidden taxes out there. In effect, I have a video on it. I think I may have did a live on it. Um, check out my YouTube channel, lots of, delicious stuff on that. But um, the net investment income tax or NIT, N-I-I-T, was put in place uh, 2018, 20, 2008, maybe 2013, one of those two, um, as part of a way to help fund the Affordable Care Act. So what it is, is if you're married, I'm getting, uh, if you're single, let's say, and you have gross income, technically a modified version of gross, but let's just call it gross income of over $200,000, any investment income you have, dividends, interest, capital gains, passive real estate rentals, passive royalties, a um, couple other less common things, but any forms of income you have like that are subject to an additional 3.8% tax on top of what their normal tax treatment is already. So if you're single, again, that starts to phase in at $200,000 of gross income. For married folks, it's $250,000 of gross income. So again, here's another uh, you know, fancy hidden ninja stealthy tax thing that is more likely to come into play for single folks and married folks, all else equal, because single folks have a lower threshold at which income threshold at which knit starts to starts to manifest itself. So it's another thing. And finally, uh, and this isn't uh, comprehensive, but these are the four big ones that people may hit. There, there might be other, you know, more esoteric things I'm not thinking of, but these are these are kind of the biggies. Uh, if you are on, a, if you have Affordable Care Act insurance, you know, ACA insurance, and you are getting or eligible to get some premium tax credit subsidies because your income is below a certain level, uh, those, those thresholds are, those income thresholds are lower for single folks than they are married folks. So there's another ding. It's not half, you know, it's, uh, but it's, it's nonetheless lower. Now, thankfully, I want to say thankfully, but if you're on Medicare, you're not eligible to get um, ACA credits anyway. So it's a non-issue if you're 65 or older for, for most people. But if you are under 65 and you are uh, getting or eligible to get Affordable Care Act insurance subsidies, this is another thing where the widow widower tax penalty may, may kind of, you know, slap you a little bit. So... Um, what can you do about this? Well, I saw David Fultz comment and I was holding it until now. 
Did Jack watch Taxes in Retirement live and do Roth conversions? Question mark. Uh, he may not have. So th there's not a great answer what to do to help prevent or avoid or minimize this. It all comes down to try, ideally, you know, if, if, if you want to, if you have to, if it makes sense for you. When you do financial planning for married couples, you always have to consider what happens if and when one spouse predeceases the other. Right. It, it's going to happen. I mean, maybe the two of you, um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but you, you pass at the same time, be it, you know, an unforeseen travel accident or something. But generally speaking, both spouses don't check out of this world at the same time. So one's going to leave before the other. That should be planned for. Now, you don't know when it's going to happen. Maybe it happens in your 60s or hopefully, you know, later in life in your 90s. But it's probably going to happen where one of you is living on. And like I said, it, it often happens more to females because females historic uh, average uh, on average live longer so this is something that needs to be considered so if this is a concern of yours and it's something you want to try to minimize how do you do it well this is where Roth conversions come in amongst other things it's all about ideally not stuffing your surviving spouse with too much taxable income going back to the example I had here what could be done here well Social Security not much right you don't want to be penny wise pound foolish don't shortchange yourself and start Social Security early to get less simply to ultimately have less to pay tax on. That's kind of, uh, that, that's going about things backwards. But in pension, same thing. I, I wouldn't voluntarily opt to take less pension income or have less survivor benefit for the sake of uh, my spouse not having, not having to pay so much in tax. What you can do is things like RMDs. So, and this is one of the lurking problems with people who have most or all their money in tax deferred accounts like traditional IRAs and 401ks is once you hit 72, maybe 75 at some point, depending on uh, you know pending legislation, you have to start taking money out and you have to start paying tax on it. Those are required minimum distributions. Now you may think, well, great, when I'm 70, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be in a lower tax environment. I'm gonna need the money anyway, I'm gonna take it out. Why is that bad? Well, as lots of you have probably seen or figured out firsthand, you're not always in a lower tax environment in retirement than you are now. A lot of people actually end up kind of being in, in a higher or worse tax environment. So anyway, um, you know, if, if it's possible to do, if you can get ahead of this years ahead of time, don't just let all your money build up and grow and snowball inside a tax deferred account because RMDs are going to have to happen. And RMDs are much more of a, of a slap tax wise to a single surviving spouse than they are to a married couple because of that higher tax bracket thing I mentioned for, for married folks. So anyway, um, Roth conversions are one way to try to get ahead of this. Now, this all ties into, well, how much should I Roth convert and when and what's the right amount for me? There is no right answer. There's no magic calculator you're going to find. There are calculators out there that do try to give you some some broad answers, but it's impossible to say with with certainty what the right amount or the right timing of Roth conversions are. My view is kind of like you, 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 you know it when you see it, right? If you have uh, two million dollars of investable assets and it's all in tax deferred accounts uh, and you have you know decent pension and social security, you're gonna have some hefty RMDs at some point on money you probably don't need to take out. You don't have to take out, but the government's gonna make you take it out. Um, this can, this is gonna exacerbate this this uh, surviving spouse, widow, whatever tax penalty thing. So and I'm ranting again. Getting ahead of some of this by doing Roth conversions or um, even spending down some of your tax deferred accounts in the earlier years of retirement, ideally in the tax planning window where your wages have stopped. So you retired, but you did not yet start your pension or social security yet. And you're not RMD age yet. There's some good years there where you're in relatively low income situations. You have some control over how your money's taxed. So consciously pull some money out of your tax deferred accounts, at least to fill up the lower tax brackets, you know, 10 and 12%, let's say tax brackets um, to start trimming and whittling down your tax deferred balances. So it doesn't just, you know, continually build and lead to really large RMDs down the road. So that's one way, um, you know, effective sort of tax efficient distribution planning, which is a real gray, vague comment I just made, you know, there's no single right or best way to do that, but working with someone who focuses on helping you make the, the most tax efficiently out of your income and your distributions uh, to the extent you have, cash value life insurance, you can take a loan against it and or home equity, like reverse mortgage. Those are decent sources of uh, loans, you know, tapping money to get some cash flow because loans aren't taxable. So you can use draws from 
a cash value life insurance loan or home equity loan, reverse mortgage loan to uh, to get yourself some cash flow without having to pay tax on it. Now, I'm not advocating that. You know, that's not a blanket statement. I'm just saying it's a possibility. If you have those things, maybe it makes sense for you to, uh, to tap those for some of your living expenses. Um, although, honestly, in this scenario, it wouldn't really help here because these are sources of income that that Diane can't get around. Social Security is always going to be there. Jack's pension is always going to be there. RMDs aren't going away at this point. Um, so it's kind of too, I don't want to say too little too late at this stage, but, you know, earlier leading up to uh, the stage where you're at RMDs, having a reverse mortgage, or if you already have cash value life insurance, you can borrow against could have some benefit because again, loan proceeds are tax-free, borrowings are tax-free sources of cash flow. Uh, that, I mean, that, that, that's kind of it. How to how to minimize widower tax penalty is just get ahead of your RMDs. Try not to let yourself have such a massive honking tax deferred account balance. If you can, if there's opportunities and it makes sense earlier in life, get ahead of it. Roth convert some of it, spend down some of it uh, intentionally. Um, QCDs, qualified charitable distributions. If Diane doesn't need as much as the $87,300 she's getting and she's charitably inclined, she can QCD away. She can donate away some of the money from her IRA straight to a charity um, that QCDs take the place of RMDs. So that'll help her shave down her tax bill somewhat. Uh, I think that's all I had. Yes, that is all I had. All I have. Let me stop my screen share. I'll go to some comments here. Let me get a little little sip of water. Put you on mute so you don't hear me. I'm back. All right. What's Cody got to say here? Including municipal bond interest can't hide from Maggie. Right. Uh, so comment. I, I assume this was in in reply to someone else, um, Cody. But municipal bonds sound good. Well, I mean, they are, they're not bad. They are good, I guess. But the interest you receive on municipal bond, most municipal bonds is tax-free at the federal level. But that interest in, in most definitions of modified adjusted gross income, including the one used for Social Security, including the one for uh, blah, 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 net investment income tax, including the one used for ACA, premium tax credits, you add back in those sources of tax-free income like municipal bond interest for purposes of calculating those modified adjusted gross incomes. So uh, municipal bonds aren't as great as they seem. They are good, but they're not as great as they seem for that reason. Okay, what else we got here? Um, ooh, Cody, question for me. How should a surviving spouse treat in a health savings account? Should they try to spend it down more quickly once they are single in retirement? Yeah, great question. Uh, I actually had this question today coincidentally from, from a client. Um, so yes, the HSAs are one of the, uh, one of the most, I, I think the most tax advantaged account out there, um, deductible contributions, tax-free growth, tax-free distributions if used for qualified medical expenses. And, uh, furthermore, the fourth tax benefit is if you make contributions through your employer and it's a section, uh, drawing a blank section 25 section 125 anyway some sort of special plan then the deduct the contributions you make to your hsa through your employer are also free of having to pay payroll taxes you know social security medicare taxes on them so anyway um yes when when a when someone has an hsa that money is all completely tax free if that person uses it to pay for qualified medical expenses or even reimburse himself or herself for qualified medical expenses during his or her life. When that person dies, if the person has a spouse, the spouse is able to pick up and run with that HSA and still preserve all the tax free magicalness of it. So long as that surviving spouse is still alive and uses it for that surviving spouse's uh, qualified medical expenses throughout the rest of his or her life. Once that second spouse dies, most of that tax-free magic mojo goes away. If you leave an HSA to anyone other than a spouse, a non-charity for now, so like a, a child, a cousin, a parent, um, the money is no longer tax-free in their hands unless they use it to reimburse expenses you had, qualified medical expenses you had while you're still alive that you did not already reimburse yourself with from your HSA. You may be asking, well, how do I possibly know that and do the record keeping? 
beats me. I don't know how that's feasible, but technically, um, if you can prove that the HS as an as a beneficiary to an HSA, uh, if you're spending it on medical expenses that the decedent had, and they didn't already tap the HSA for those, then yes, those are tax-free withdrawals. Otherwise, you take the money out for the fun of it, or for any other reason for that matter, it's completely taxable. You have to take it all out in the year the person died. Um, and it's all 100%, you know, ordinary income tax to you. So not great. So this is the point of Cody's question. Yes, uh, if you're a surviving spouse, you inherit an HSA, you do want to ideally try to spend it down before you die. Now, obviously, you don't know when you're going to die. So it makes it hard to do. You know, HSAs are good to preserve as long as possible, let them really get the most growth as possible. But you don't want to die with a lot left over unless you're leaving it to a spouse. Like, like I said, you don't want to die with a lot left over and leave it to, to a kid or something because the tax isn't good for them. So yes, try to spend it in your life. If you have reason to think, you know, your life is going to get cut short, be it months or years, or, you know, you have some medical condition, then, then by all means, yeah, you know, empty that sucker out uh, on medical expenses. But if you're still healthy, you still have good reason to think you're going to live another 10, 20 years. I'd still probably try to drag it out and, and, you know, preserve that HSA as long as possible. Great question, Cody. Uh, more about our little ditty about Jack and Diane. Does Diane have to take RMBs from Jack's inheritance if she doesn't roll into her own, into her account? Oh yeah. Good question. Um, so when, when someone dies and they have a spouse, the spouse has a few options for what to do with that with that uh inherited ira this the spouse can roll it into his or her own um and then at which point it just acts like it was always that spouse's ira ah oh, man i'm drawing a blank i should know this the other option is they used to be able to take rmds as if you were anyone else now i i don't i don't remember if the surviving spouse can still take life based life expectancy based rmds or if the surviving spouse's only other option is to, to empty it within 10 years, that might be the case. I'd have to double check that. But generally speaking, even if the surviving spouse in our case, so Diane 72, she's of RMD age, would it be better for her to instead take the 10 year option on the IRA and just take the money out at some point over those 10 years? I'm, I, Probably not. I mean, there may be some some scenario where maybe it makes sense, but I'd have to think no, because under that 10 year rule, you're, you're forced to take it all out within 10 years. It doesn't need to be sprinkled throughout. You can take it all out, you know, on the 10th year, but that's going to be a doozy of a tax hit that year. So um, whereas if she makes it her own and just goes by her life expectancy RMDs, then she can at least kind of dribble it out over her life expectancy. So probably makes the most sense for her to make it her own this is usually the case but uh, you know i can't say with certainty that there's never a circumstance where it makes sense for her to uh sh take some other uh inheritance option for it she, I, I think she can she can uh disclaim it perhaps so if she's named as the primary i'd have to double check this as well but if she's named as the primary and let's assume they have two kids and the kids were the secondary beneficiaries if she doesn't want or need the money I, I believe she can disclaim it and say, I, I know I'm the primary beneficiary. I don't want it. Let it flow through me. You know, keep it going. Go to the two secondary beneficiaries instead. Let them have it and have to take it out within 10 years. Maybe that makes more sense from a generational wealth transfer, estate planning, legacy goal kind of thing. But if she does need this money, then it's I'm almost certain that the, the best option is for her just to roll it into her own, make it her own, and have to be subject to those RMDs because she's 72. Uh, good question, whoever this was. What if Jack and Diane own a house for many decades with a huge increase? Ooh, good one. Good one. I know where you're going with this. A $750,000 increase in value when Jack passes. Diane decides to sell five years later. What does the tax look like on the gains? This also is a scenario I'm uh, currently going through in, in real life. So, right. Great point. I'm glad you brought this up. This was another one I'm, I, I probably should have added to like one of the other tax penalty, uh, whatever, whatever tax penalty things to keep in mind. So if you're married and and you sell a home, primary residence, you can exclude up to $500,000 of gain from taxability on the sale of that house. So if you bought a house, you know, eons ago for $100,000, you live in a, a state where that's had really high house price growth, like California, for example, the house is now a million bucks and you go to sell it and you're married, you have a $900,000 gain you can exclude 500,000 of it such that your taxable gain is only 400,000. Yay. Um, if you're single, 
that gain exclusion is only $250,000, not $500,000. For married folks, here, here's where it's a slight, slightly more involved. Or I mean, for uh, when one spouse dies. So I looked this up. I didn't know this until I looked it up a, month, a couple months ago. But when one spouse dies, the other spouse can still file a, a joint tax return that year. That I already knew. That, you know, that, that's not what I found out. So in the year of death, whether the spouse dies January 1st or December 31st, the surviving spouse can still file that year's tax return as joint. So that's good. Starting next year, it has to be single. Regarding the, the home primary home gain sale exclusion, that doesn't go away that year. You can actually, I think, um, even though the spouse died, the surviving spouse still has two years from the date of the spouse's death to still use that $500,000 married exclusion. I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's what I looked up a couple months back when I researched this. So that doesn't immediately go away, but you do lose it at some point, And I believe it's two years after the spouse died. At that point, if you don't sell the house within then and you sell after, then your gain exclusion is only $250,000. So that that is and could be a very big difference from a tax perspective. Um, so if you're the surviving spouse, you do plan on selling the house in the next you know couple years, you, you almost certainly want to do it within that two-year time frame to get the maximum gain exclusion. If the gain exclusion applies, some folks it doesn't matter. If you bought the house for four hundred thousand, now it's only five hundred thousand. Well, guess what? You know, you're, you're still it's only a hundred thousand dollar gain, whether you're married or single. Your gain exclusion more than covers it. But if you have a lot of gain, like seven hundred fifty grand, you do want to pay attention to when do you start to lose that uh, five hundred thousand dollar married gain exclusion. Uh, great comment, whoever this was. Uh, and what happens if you don't know the value of the house at Jack's death? Um, well, I, I don't know if this is in response to someone else, but basically you get an appraisal. Um, that, that's the, mo the most surefire way is get a formal, you know, uh, a professional appraiser, appraiser to come out and give you a written appraisal. And in absence of that, from what I heard, you can get away with like realtors, you know, have, calling up a couple of realtors, have them give you some, some quotes. Zillow, maybe, although I well, I'm, I want to say I'm not comfortable saying that's completely defensible in the eyes of the IRS. Be like, no, well, Zillow said my house is worth X. Um, but, you know, in theory, that that's one bit of data, one bit of input. So, yeah, you may not know exactly, but you can get an appraiser to 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 uh, write up a value for you. Um, yeah. David Fultz, what about doing tax gain harvesting prior to death of the first spouse? Yeah, th that as well. That's another thing to help get ahead of this tax gain, tax loss harvest, or I guess tax gain harvesting. Uh, I did a video about this on YouTube as well. Basically, if your income is low enough, um, you, you can get away with having some of your long-term capital gains taxed at 0%. So if that applies to you, that, that's an option. Maybe you sell some things at gains, take advantage of that zero. And the reason why I say that is, is because uh, for married folks, that income level where the zero percent capital gains tax bracket stops is double than what it is for single folks. So another example of, you know, single person's income based threshold getting cut in this case in half is a uh, 0% long-term capital gain tax bracket. Thoughts about using a pension max scenario, i.e. no survivor benefit, but life insurance. So the cash won't be an annual. Fund. Yeah. Um, definitely a possibility you'd have to run the numbers and see. So what this person is saying is when you have a pension, you have an option usually of taking it as a just your own life. So the pension stops when you stop, or you can elect some sort of joint and survivor where if you die before your spouse, your the payment lives on for your spouse. Now you can often elect to have a hundred percent of the payment live on for your spouse or only half the payment or 75% of the payment. And they all have different payment amounts. So the highest payment you'll get is if you select no survivor benefits, meaning the payment stops when you stop. That'll be your highest monthly payout. If you select one of the survivor options, you're going to get a lower monthly amount while you're alive. But if and when you die, that lower monthly amount lives on for your spouse. So the question is, instead of taking the lower payment now to get some sort of spousal uh, benefit upon my death, what if, knowing that that benefit's going to be taxable and may play into this widow or tax penalty thing I'm, I'm rambling about here, what if instead I take the higher uh, pension payment that does not have a survivor benefit for my spouse 
and I take the difference. So let's say the survivor benefit payment was a thousand bucks a month. I'm making this number up. And the my life only payment option is uh, $1,300 a month. What if I take the my life only option? I take that $300 extra and use that to, to pay every month into an insurance policy such that when I die, that insurance then pays out to my spouse, surviving spouse. That, that could be the right way to do it. A little more complicated, a little more involved. It also depends what age you are when you do this. Are you insurable? How much uh, is the premium going to cost? How much insurance can you get? So there's, there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. But in theory, yes. Um, life insurance is a really good way to tax efficiently leave money to people because death benefits from any life insurance policy are most. There may be some that are somewhat taxable, but for the most part, uh, any life insurance you have is uh, the death benefits completely tax free in the hands of the uh, you know the death beneficiary. So this could be this could be an option. So you you look out for your spouse upon your death by having this life insurance policy that pays to him or her as opposed to getting this pension that has this uh, benefit that lives on. Um, good comment. Might make sense. Uh, I don't think you can be titled inherited IRA. The 10 year rule may apply to drain the account. Okay. Yeah. I, I have to look that up. That was one of these funky secure act things that changed in late 2019. I knew it at the time, but haven't looked into it in a while. Why can't you do a Roth conversion from the TSP while working? Uh, I don't know if this is in reference to someone else's comment, but Simply, if the plan doesn't allow it, some plans allow you to do in-plan conversions from the pre-tax account to the Roth account. Some plans don't. I don't think the TSP, the Federal Thrift Savings Plan, allows it, and a lot of 401ks don't. Although some do, you you have to ask your plan administrator and see. Mm -hmm. Teresa Wood, Diane, her own, her own with her lifetime spread, leave it as inherited, and since he started, wouldn't it be his or five-year window? Yeah, this is going back to the options for uh, for Diane inheriting the account. I, I, I don't recall what the different options are available to Diane. I don't know if it'd be five years. That doesn't sound right. Maybe, I don't know. But anyway, okay. Does the surviving spouse get a step up in basis in the house? Depends. Um, if the house is, so if you're in a community property state, step up in basis is really good. Uh, so let's assume you two bought the house joint uh 30 years ago for a hundred thousand bucks each of your respective costs was fifty thousand dollars you know 50 50 in that house if you live in a community property state like california arizona and i think there's nine community property states in total um when one spouse dies assuming it's community property so you know you bought the property while you were in the community property state um which i guess for a house it has to be because by definition it's in that state Anyway, so when one spouse dies, yes, the the basis in the hands of the surviving spouse gets fully stepped up. So in our case, let's assume the house is worth a million dollars when the first spouse died. The basis in the hands of the surviving spouse is now a hundred. Am I saying this right? Is now a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, I'm questioning myself. Why am I questioning myself? question myself because I'm going through this scenario. I have, I have to circle back and think about this. But yeah, I, I think community property gets a full step up in the hands of the surviving spouse. In a non-community property state, what happens is, is that true? That's awesome if that's true for a house. Wow. So if there's a $100,000 house bought 30 years ago in a community property state of California, one spouse dies, the house is currently worth a million is that cost now uh, is the basis now a million dollars in the hands of the surviving spouse? That sounds too good to be true, but I, I feel like that's the right answer. Wow, I gotta I gotta look into this. Sorry, sidebar in my in my head. Um, in a non-community property state, where's David Myers? Is he here? He'll know this stuff. He's 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 uh he's sharp sharp as a tack with this stuff, and he's in California. So if David Myers, if you hear this, uh, please chime in about step up and basis on a house in a community property state. Let's assume California. Um, in a non-community property state, the way step up and basis works is the survive. And I just did this in New Jersey uh, for someone last year, the surviving spouse. So going back to the example, you bought the house 30 years ago for 50 grand each. The house was hundred thousand dollars. So each spouse had a, had a basis of 50 grand. When one spouse dies, the surviving spouse gets the deceased spouse's basis stepped up to the current value. So let's put some numbers to this and numbers aren't great. Cause I don't have, you know, I'm just here talking, but anyway, um, let's assume the house is now worth a million dollars again. 
So the deceased spouse's half was worth 500,000 now. The uh, surviving spouse's basis is now the deceased spouse's stepped up 500,000 and the surviving spouse's original 50,000. So the house basis in the hands of the surviving spouse is now $550,000. Okay versus the current value is a million dollars. So that's how step up works in a non-community property state in a community property. Uh, I think it's fully stepped up, which, which is really awesome if it is. I'd have to double check that. Yeah, so Cody Garrett, that's correct. Community property gets a step up on both halves. Non-community property only receives a step. So, so then Cody, riddle me this. Um, married couple in California has a highly appreciated house they bought a while ago one spouse dies the other spouse is interested in selling uh and, and is concerned about the five hundred thousand dollar gain exemption getting cut to 250 for being single does this not matter assuming the house doesn't further appreciate does it not matter because there's no gain at this point because the, the surviving spouse's basis is now a hundred thousand dollars versus the house's current value is $100,000? Is this is, is the thoughts in my head off or not that we have to worry about this uh, property gain uh, exclusion at this point because of step up in basis? Anyway, not to put you on the spot, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. If, if you know, and that sounds right, let me know. But that that um, that's awesome if that's the case. Um, I have to talk to my client about that. Okay, and what is this? Sorry, I joined late. Uh, my father-in-law passed away this year. What are the important tax considerations to consider before the end of this year? Um, that's a pretty broad question. So, uh, blah, 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 I, I don't know. So your father-in-law passed away. I guess you mean regarding inheritance and stuff like that? Uh, or do you mean for, for him and his final year tax return? I don't know. That's a separate, separate discussion, I guess. Okay, um, looks like that's it. So it went longer than I expected. That's good, I guess. Maybe because I talked too much, maybe because... Uh, uh, oh, so you mean for your mother-in-law, I guess. So what are the important tax considerations to consider for your mother-in-law surviving spouse before the end of the year? Good question. Um, so first, my condolences. Uh, secondly... From a tax perspective, the, your mother-in-law, surviving spouse, will be able to still file this year's tax return as married filing joint. So she doesn't immediately lose any any tax uh, you know, benefit or features this year. Starting next year, different story. She's going to have to start filing a single unless she gets remarried next year. But she's going to have to start filing a single next year. And you know, uh, definitely go back and check this video when I post the replay up tomorrow morning. You'll, you'll see what I mean. There's an example in here about, about this stuff. Um, so important tax considerations. I mean, to the extent she can, if she was planning on doing conversions or was already doing Roth conversions, it would be in her interest to sort of front load and get some more in this year while she's still under joint tax return brackets. Cause again, starting next year, her, her, her tax brackets are going to condense and get cut in half. Um, so that, that's probably a biggie. Um, yeah, go, go back and check, you know, watch the rest of the video. I'm, I don't have a succinct list in my head of all things for her to consider, but the rest of the video should shed a lot of light on that. Uh, so that'll help. Okay. I guess that's it. Um, thank you all for joining. I don't know. What is next week's topic? I don't even know. Let me take a look here. Uh, next week I'm ruminating about, uh, Oh yeah. Demystifying and answering your questions about social security. So this, this is kind of a new one. Um, my, my thought with this, I'm going to talk about the basics of social security. And I know lots of people have lots of questions about social security. So I'm, I'm going to have that be like an open-ended part, me talking part Q and a, and just see where it goes. Um, nothing in particular about social security. I want to discuss just, I know lots of you have lots of questions. So this will kind of be your free for all to, uh, to pepper me with social security stuff next week. Um, what is, yeah, that's a good question. Let's start with that. What is it? I don't know. I should probably find out before next week. Anyway, all right. Well, thank you all. Thanks for joining. Um, and I will see you next week. Take care.